My dad took me to one game at the polo grounds. We're seated down the right field line, and I'm on my father's shoulders when he says to me, Bobby, look, see that player right there? That's Willie Mays. As if he was saying to his son the equivalent of, son, that's the Washington Monument. That's the Grand Canyon. You'll never forget having been here. That's Willie Mays. Now, back to Willard and Dibbs on 95.7 The Game. And we love that. We've played that now for ourselves about three or four times this afternoon as we get ready to hang out and uh, are blessed enough to talk with Bob Costas. That's from the Say Hey Willie Mays documentary that's currently on HBO Max. Bob and many others have just unbelievable stories and perspective about the life of Willie Mays, who he was as a ball player, a person, and Bob joins us now on Willard and Dibs on 95.7 The Game. Hey, Bob, how are you? Hey, guys. How you doing? You know, I'm so glad that HBO, and they did a great job with it, was able to get that done, not only while Willie was still with us, but while he was able to participate in the documentary. Uh, it was maybe three years ago that they spoke with him and two years ago that the film came out. And Willie, you could tell that he was aging, but he was still sharp in his observations and still aware. And I'm just very glad that they made that uh, and that Willie and his family were able to see it. And now it's part of the historical record and it's archived forever on HBO Max. And if people haven't seen it, especially if they're Giant fans and Willie Mays fans, they should make it a point to look it up. You said in the piece that I saw today on Yahoo Sports that it's both poetic and poignant that he died just a couple of days before the game and now just one day before the Rickwood Field game. Tomorrow that will be in many ways to honor him. Explain more about what you think about just what you said in that statement. Well, Willie did play in the Negro Leagues briefly as a 17-year-old with the Birmingham Black Barons in 1948, and he played at Rickwood Field. And as baseball's greatest living player, no dispute about that, when they first came up with the idea of having a game at Rickwood Field and having the Giants participate against the Cardinals, uh, that it would be a tribute to the Negro Leagues overall, but also to Willie Mays. That made perfect sense. So his presence will be felt there tomorrow night. There's no question about it. And it is poignant, obviously, uh, that he passes away and that there will be a ceremony so soon after his passing that acknowledges his place not only in overall baseball history, but his place in Negro League history. Bob, you were once quoted as saying you had to have seen Mays to appreciate him. So for, for a couple of people who did not get to do that, how do you go about best describing it? Well, the numbers themselves are staggering, but his charisma, his presence, the flair and genuine style, not something contrived, not the kind of exhibitionism you sometimes see today. A guy hits a double in the fourth inning of a game on July 8th and acts as if he climbed Mount Everest or something. <laughs> Willie, Willie had actual style in everything he did even fielding a routine fly ball with that basket catch, or the way he loped out of the dugout back to the outfield as an inning began, a walk from the on-deck circle to the plate. Everything about him exuded style and dynamism and excitement. So it's one thing to be great. Even if he was boring, the statistics tell you that he was indisputably great, one of the greatest ever just based on the pure objective accomplishments. But then there is the presence of Willie Mays, and he was well aware of that. And he often said, you have got to entertain the people. And by now, just about everybody who cares has heard this story, but it's true. He purposely wore a cap, a half size too small, so that when he was sprinting into the gap to rob somebody of an extra base hit or racing around the bases to turn a double into a triple, the hat would fly off. That was one of his signatures and people would go crazy about that he was a genuinely great player and he was a genuine not a contrived a genuine showman and how much did that dynamism as you put it and the showman and the flair how important was that to a new market like san francisco in the 50s when they leave new york they come out here and they're trying to really expose people to what major league yeah. baseball is yeah, and I understand. I mean, I was just a little kid 
then. I, I saw the one game at the Polo Grounds in person. You played the clip from the HBO thing. I was five years old, and I don't know if my dad had a crystal ball, if he knew that the Dodgers and Giants were leaving after that season, uh, and they might never return, and his son better see Willie Mays play, but that's the way it played out. But So I don't really have any firsthand knowledge of what happened upon Willie's arrival in San Francisco, but from what I've heard from those who were around and what I've read, Willie was not embraced as enthusiastically as you would think. Part of the reason was that although Joe DiMaggio never played in the National League, obviously was a Yankee, he was a San Franciscan, and he had played in the Pacific Coast League, and people felt a certain allegiance to Joe DiMaggio, another great center fielder. And maybe some Giant fans, it seems so peculiar now in retrospect, they wanted not someone they adopted from New York, they wanted their own guys. And almost as soon as they arrived, along comes McCovey and Cepeda. So they were San Francisco giants in the minds of some fans, at least initially. And Willie was a transplanted New York giant. But in the long run, even though Cepeda and McCovey were Hall of Fame players, not only the greatest giant of all time, but arguably the greatest player for any team of all time is Willie Mays. So the weight of the evidence just made the case for Willie, not just as a player, but as a presence, because he was not only the best player, he was the most entertaining and exciting player to watch. Just an incredible baseball historian, Bob Costas, who is a very big part of the documentary on HBO Max, Say Hey, Willie Mays, and he's joining us right now on Willard and Dibbs, 95.7 The Game. Bob, I've also loved reading about your perspective as a New York kid at the time of Willie Mays and Mickey Mantle and how Mm -hmm. baseball fans everywhere sort of had to choose. Were you a Mantle person or were you a Mays person? What, What can you share about that dynamic? Yeah, and first I'll lay this out. I was a Mantle person almost by default. I remember that one game because my dad took me to the game in 1957, but by the time I really become aware of baseball and start to learn about it, the Dodgers and the Giants have left, and the Mets don't exist yet. So the only team in New York is the Yankees. They're a great team. They win the pennant almost every year, and Mickey Mantle is the greatest player in the American League. I have a cousin, my lifelong closest friend. He's a few years older than me, and he was a Willie Mays fan because he was old enough to grasp it and understand it. And he stayed a Willie Mays fan, even living in New York, when Willie went out to San Francisco. And when the Mets existed, his mom and dad would make sure that he went to games when the Mets played the Giants and Willie Mays came to town. So it's just a matter of timing that I became a Yankee fan, and therefore I was a Mickey Mantle fan. But even then, as a kid, I recognized that while a healthy Mantle, and I'll get back to this in a minute, but a healthy Mantle offensively, was certainly the equal of Willie Mays. But although Mickey, before his legs gave out, was a good center fielder, Mays was a great, a super great center fielder. Mantle was very fast and a high percentage base stealer who could beat out drag bunts. But Willie was just a great genius base runner not only his speed but his sense of the game he virtually never made a mistake on the bases he just knew everything he needed to know the the strength of the opposing outfielders arms what the game situation was he was just superlative in every big way and little way when it came to baseball so even when i was 10 11 years old i knew that maybe as a hitter mantle could make a case but as an all-round player then the nod had to go to willie but In fairness, and younger fans may not appreciate this, they'll look at baseball reference and look at Mickey Mantle and say, oh, sure, he's an obvious Hall of Fame player, but he's not in the same class as Mays and Aaron. And that's based on cumulatively. But if you were to cut it off after their first 12, 13 seasons, Mantle, especially as a hitter, that is a legitimate argument. Mantle's slugging percentage, his homers per time at bat, his on-base percentage because he walked more than Aaron or Mays did, those numbers stack up very favorably. But then, for a variety of reasons, his prime was shorter, his overall career was shorter, and the cumulative numbers of Aaron and Mays zoom past him. So by the judgment overall, they rank ahead of him. But in his prime, Mantle was a damn good player.
Yeah, without a doubt, Bob Costas here on 95.7 The Game. How much do you and all baseball fans who are older miss the, the five tools as opposed to what we have now, which is the three true outcomes? Well, I don't know that everybody is confined to the three true outcomes. You know, Mike Trout has had injuries of late, but he was pretty close to a five-tool player. Early in his career, he stole a lot of bases. Uh, Shohei Otani might be a six-tool player <laughs> if, when, when he's also <laughs> pitching. When, when he comes back uh, next year and pitches, he's a true unicorn. Uh, Mookie Betts is a great all-round player. Aaron Judge is a very good outfielder, started as a right fielder, now playing center field, uh, runs the bases well hitting over 300 now and on a 50-plus home run pace once again. So I don't think the five-tool player is extinct. And in truth, a really great true five-tool player was all at the level of a Maze or an Aaron or a healthy Mantle, uh, a Joe DiMaggio, that kind of thing. That was always a rarity at any point in baseball history. Bob, what if we go beyond baseball for a second? And and Jackie Robinson was the first through the door, Willie Mays shortly thereafter, uh -huh. and the two of them did not always see eye to eye on how to go about handling those roles. And I know that, that you've spoken about uh, Willie Mays' effect and, and the way he did it, you know, even, for yeah. instance, appearing on the all-white sitcoms um, and, 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 and the effect that that had on the way the black player was accepted by, by white America. How would you yeah. put all of that into words, what, what Willie's effect was? Yeah, well, Jackie Robinson gently nudged Willie Mays to be more outspoken, but it just wasn't in Willie's nature. Not everybody, even if they're sympathetic to a cause, is suited to step out in that way. I don't know that Willie did that out of caution or timidity. I just think it, the way he was was what was truest to his personality. Of course, Jackie Robinson wasn't just a trailblazer in baseball. Jackie Robinson is an important person in American history who continued to push for racial justice in the years that remained after he retired from baseball. And Willie had contemporaries like Hank Aaron, who became a civil rights hero because of the way he handled the burden of the bigotry he faced in the pursuit of Babe Ruth's record, and Bill Russell and Jim Brown and someone like Arthur Ashe and, of course, Muhammad Ali. Those people have an important place in America's social history, not just sports history. But Martin Luther King said to Willie Mays and others, this, of course, was when Willie was still an active player, MLK said, Look, all of you, in some sense, have played a role in the civil rights movement because you force America, overall, white America, to see you on your merits because sports is a meritocracy. And in how you carry yourselves, they can't, a fair-minded person can't deny your value as an individual. Now, fast forward many years. Barack Obama, in his first year as president, threw out the first pitch at the All-Star Game in St. Louis, and he flew into the game on Air Force One, obviously, with Willie Mays. And he told Willie Mays almost the same thing. Willie, I wasn't just a fan of yours, but you and the other great players and other early significant embraced by America overall, public figures, black public figures, you all had a part in getting me to where I am right now as the president of the United States. I don't think Martin Luther King and Barack Obama said those things just to be polite. They could have said something else to be nice. I think they said those things because it was insightful and it was true. Uh, was Willie Mays Muhammad Ali? No. But was Willie Mays true to himself? And was he a genuine national treasure mourned by all Americans now? And does that matter? It does. Bob Costas here on 95.7 The Game. Great historical perspective on Willie Mays and, and the off-the-field legacy. And I'm wondering, Bob, about the future of black players in Major League Baseball and what can be done to help encourage participation to get the, the numbers back to where they were a generation ago. You can't fault baseball for not trying. Uh, the programs, RBI, Reviving Baseball in the Inner Cities, uh, the Academies, even... 
celebrating the Negro Leagues and its history and what they're doing this week at Rickwood Field and the prominent African-American players. Obviously, there are many players of color uh, in baseball, uh, players of Hispanic descent, Asian descent, and there's no barrier uh, based on bigotry any longer. Baseball wants, as all sports want, the best possible talent wherever they can find it. And those you know, players like Mookie Betts and others um, are out there encouraging young people, all young people, but in this case perhaps particularly African-American youngsters who are athletically inclined to consider baseball. I mean, you can't, you can't drag them kicking and screaming if the, if the kid doesn't want to play and if, if basketball or football has a greater hold on a larger percentage of young African-American athletes than baseball does. That's a shame because baseball has a glorious history of black players, both in the Negro Leagues and in the modern major leagues. Uh, and the more players of all backgrounds that are out there, the better. But I can't, I can't criticize baseball for not trying. Bob Costas with us. Bob, uh, I, I have no idea if when people get old, they do have a say in when they go or not. Um, but, but the fact that this happened this week, right as we prepare for, for Rick Woodfield, I, 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 A, wonder what your comment is on that, but B, I also wonder how you feel that might e even change tomorrow's festivities a little bit. Well, I think it, it heightens the emotion around it. It's both poignant and poetic that he passes away so close to this event. Uh, he issued a statement, or a statement was issued in his name, um, only hours before he passed away, uh, sending his regrets for not being able to be there. I had inquired with Larry Bear, the Giants president, only a couple of weeks ago, uh, is Willie going to be able to make it? And Larry shook his head in a way that told me not only is he not going to make it, but he may, may not ever make another public appearance, uh, which turned out to be the case. Uh, when they first announced the idea of this Rickwood game, Willie very much wanted to be there. It's, it's part of his life story. Um, and, you know, what mattered to you in your youth matters all the more uh, as you creep up past 80 and, and 90. Uh, so I'm sure that Willie in his heart really wanted to be there, but that heart just eventually gave out. Yeah, and it's just so sad that it happened two days before the game would be contested. That's tomorrow, obviously, in Alabama. And even though Willie wouldn't have been there, it still would have been somehow more appropriate for him to at least be able to enjoy it from afar here yeah. in San Francisco. Is it too much of a stretch to think that maybe the, the entire number 24 could be retired throughout Major League Baseball in honor of Willie Mays? Well, they did it for Jackie Robinson, understandably. Uh, there are some people who say that they should retire 21 for Roberto Clemente. Uh, the Mets retired 24 for Willie. He only played a couple of years, and he was diminished right at the end of his career, a couple of years as a Met. But the Mets' stated intention there was, we're retiring it as a tribute to Willie's place in the history of New York baseball. Yeah, he wore 24 for the Mets, but he wore 24 for the New York Giants. So that makes sense. Uh, I think that baseball has to be careful about getting on a slippery slope where every great player, should they then retire 44 for Hank Aaron? You could make a pretty strong case, just about equal to the case for Willie Mays. Um, I think that these players have been recognized and honored and will continue to be more than enough. And there are other ways besides, you know, having half the numbers in baseball right, retired right. eventually, you know. Bob, would love your perspective on this. It, it, it wasn't that long ago, maybe five or six years ago, ceremony here in San Francisco at the ballpark for Barry Bonds. And, mm -hmm. and Willie comments at that ceremony, uh, we got to get Barry Bonds in into the Hall of Fame. Yeah. Um, wh what are your thoughts on Willie's effect on that and, and, and where that stands? Well, in the writers' voting phase, Bonds and Clemens came pretty close to 75% in the 10th and final year. Then the first time that Barry uh, came under consideration only a few months later uh, by a veterans committee, 
he didn't get much of a, of the vote at all. That doesn't doom him to that fate eternally, but he didn't get much traction the first time with the Veterans Committees. I have always said that you could make a case for Barry Bonds and maybe for Roger Clemens that's different than the case for others who were involved with steroids because they were indisputably of Hall of Fame quality, especially Bonds, before the evidence shows that they ever took anything more potent than Flintstones vitamins and a protein shake. <laughs> you know, if Barry Bonds retires in the late 1990s, he's a new unanimous first ballot Hall of Famer, and deservedly so. He's an inner circle Hall of Famer on his true natural merits. And, you know, people see things, not everybody, but too many people in social media and, and the worst aspects of talk radio, not guys like you, but we know what's out there to some extent. Everything has to be a hot take. Everything has to be binary. And so if you have a criticism of somebody, you hate them. I don't. Not only do I not hate Barry Bonds, I find a lot of things that are admirable and appealing about Barry Bonds. And even if that weren't the case, you cannot deny his greatness as a player. But there is a clear dividing line from clean Barry Bonds and steroid Barry Bonds. But if he were elected to the Hall of Fame, since there are some players in the Hall of Fame now who we can reasonably assume used performance-enhancing drugs, and they're not going to remove them from the Hall of Fame, I don't think that would be the worst thing ever. Uh, I have no problem with that. I think as somebody who tries to do honest commentary, and people don't always have to agree with me, uh, I've said when asked, do I think that Barry Bonds' record, Mark McGuire's homers, Sammy Sosa's 360 home run seasons, do I think those are authentic performances? I do not. Do I think that Barry Bonds on his nat natural merits was an authentically great player? I absolutely do. Bob, what a treat to have you today. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, guys. There it is. Bob Costas with us on uh, on Willard and Dibs on 95.7 again. That's Bob freaking Costas. That's Bob Costas. From man. the opening.